The ideal gas law. Everyone knows it. Everyone learns it in grade school. It consolidates a bunch of other specialized relations like Boyle's Law that folks codified around the same time that steam engines became the new hotness. It shows the relationship between pressure, temperature, and volume for an ideal gas. But what makes a gas ideal? Well, back in the day, an ideal gas was a gas that obeyed the ideal gas law, which is circular logic. You know, the best kind of logic that has absolutely no holes in it except the large, gaping one it makes right in the middle of itself. Of course, I'm joking. As with many scientific relationships, the ideal gas law was worked out empirically first, and a full understanding of the underlying mechanism came later. The ideal gas law is incomplete and does not apply to all situations, and that was obvious even back when it was first codified. The most glaring proof of that is that if you compress a vapor like water steam to a high enough pressure, it will condense into a liquid, even at temperatures above 100 Celsius. The ideal gas law doesn't predict condensation under any condition. But such deviations from ideal gas behavior were treated not as a universal behavior of all gases, but only of certain pesky non-ideal gases. Gases such as hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon monoxide were called permanent gases, because no one had yet been able to condense them into liquids. Until the mid-1800s, permanent gases were considered a distinctly different class of matter from what were called vapors. Gases like steam, generated from the evaporation of liquids. Similarly, when Cagnard de Latour first reported on the critical point behavior of gases in 1822, most people dismissed his discovery as only being a curious property of the specific gases he tested, as opposed to the universal property that it really was. Physicist Michael Faraday was one of few who recognized that de Latour might be on to something important, but wider recognition, as well as a name for the phenomenon, was decades in coming. Faraday and William Wewell workshop names like Turian State or Canard de la Tour Point. Dmitry Mendeleev, of periodic table fame, proposed calling it the absolute boiling point. It would be Thomas Andrews at Queen's University Belfast who had coined the term critical point in 1869 and performed significant experiments detailing gas condensation behavior. But no one was any closer to adequately explaining the physical cause of critical point behavior or even why gases condensed in the first place. They had an experimentally derived equation of state for a gas, the ideal gas law, and experimentally derived equations of state for liquids, compressibility equations. One problem, of many, that the critical point posed was that it implied that these two equations that look nothing like each other had to somehow smoothly merge into one. In his 1873 PhD dissertation, Johannes Diedrich van der Waals proposed something remarkable. He showed that two simple modifications to the ideal gas law could, qualitatively, predict both gas condensation and the existence of the critical point. What would become known as the van der Waals equation of state would not only be the first equation to model non-ideal gas behavior, it would have greater implications regarding the fundamental properties of all matter, and would win van der Waals the 1910 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. The equation starts with one assumption, upon which the two additional terms would be based. It was not a universally accepted idea at the time, and while its proponents were a large and steadily growing faction, many, especially those outside the fields of chemistry and statistical mechanics, some of whom are prominent names even today, dismissed it as an unproven theory, or an idle curiosity of no importance. Buckle up and hold on to your hats, folks. Van der Waals argued that molecules exist. Shocking, I know. Some detractors argued that molecular theory added no significant insight beyond what could be gleaned from empirical testing. A terrible argument in this case along the lines of, I don't see how it has any relevance to my field of specialty, so who cares? Another argument was that the theory was not scientific because molecules are theorized to be so small as to be impossible, with current technology, to observe directly and thus their existence could neither be confirmed nor falsified. A marginally better argument, but entirely short-sighted. And of course, there was the timeless argument that is no less prevalent today. I'm smart, so if I don't understand it, it must therefore be wrong. But molecular theory would gain ground and stand on increasingly solid scientific footing until Einstein's publication on Brownian motion would finally silence the last detractors in 1905. Going back to the question at the top of this video, 
The ideal gas law applies at high temperature, low pressure, or dilute gas concentration. Under these conditions, the gas molecules are far enough apart that their discrete nature can be ignored. The molecules are effectively treated as point particles with no volume that don't interact with each other at all. The van der Waals equation of state basically does away with both of those ideas, arguing that 1. Molecules have volume and occupy space, blocking other molecules from occupying that same space. And 2. Molecules are attracted to each other by some type of force. Let's tackle each assumption in turn. The idea that molecules occupy space is immediately intuitive, but understanding its effect and placement in the categories of thermodynamic interactions is a bit less so. Imagine a solid sphere of radius r. Now take another sphere and place it right next to the first one. The spheres can't overlap, obviously, so there is a region of space that is off limits to the second sphere due to the presence of the first one. If you mark the center of the second sphere, you'll notice that the center can't enter within a certain spherical volume of the first. It's excluded from it, so to speak. For two identical spherical molecules, the excluded volume per molecule works out to be four times the volume of the molecule. Now, the real volume that any one molecule has open access to is reduced by this excluded volume. And this excluded volume depends on both the size and concentration of gas molecules. In the van der Waals equation of state, this is implemented in a very straightforward way. Just change the specific volume term to V minus B, where B is the amount of excluded volume per molecule. What this extra term means is that the effective volume a gas molecule sees is reduced because other molecules are in the way. This causes increased pressure or expansion of the gas above what would be expected in the ideal case. What is a bit trickier to understand is what flavor of thermodynamic interaction this is, so to speak. In thermodynamics, most interactions or effects can be categorized as either entropic, enthalpic, or a mixture of the two. I'll let you guess which category the excluded volume effect falls into. You can pause the video if you so please. It's entropic, sometimes called the excluded volume entropy. An explanation of why it's entropic is beyond the scope of this short video, but if you're familiar with statistical mechanics and Boltzmann entropy, you might see why this is true. The second term that van der Waals added is a bigger leap of logic. Van der Waals believed that molecules in a liquid, or solid, must be held together by some sort of force. A force that is mutually attractive and acts between molecules to draw them together, but gets much weaker the farther apart the molecules are. When a liquid is boiled into a gas, thermal energy overwhelms this molecular attraction, but it doesn't turn it off. The force is still active, the gas molecules are just so far apart and moving so fast that it doesn't matter. The exact nature of this force was unknown. Gravity was too weak, while the magnetic and coulombic forces were too strong. And most gas molecules were demonstrably non-magnetic and electrically neutral anyways. We would later understand this force to be quantum mechanical in nature and call it the van der Waals force, but at that time the nature of the force was left as an open question. As for how the molecular attraction is implemented in the equation of state, here's the original explanation that van der Waals put forth. Imagine gas molecules in a container, focusing on the volume of gas right next to the container wall. The hypothesized attractive force causes the gas molecules to slightly tug on each other, pulling them together. Molecules in this edge layer headed on a collision course with the wall of the container feel this tug from other gas molecules in the vessel and are slowed down by it. As a result, the eventual collision has less force behind it than expected, and since gas pressure is an expression of these collisions, this attractive force reduces the pressure of the gas compared to the ideal case. The gas molecules one layer in from the edge layer are the ones most responsible for tugging the edge layer back, and the strength of that tugging depends on the density of molecules in that adjacent layer as well as the density of molecules in the edge layer. More molecules means a stronger force. The total effect is multiplicative, so the force term is some constant times density squared. Density is proportional to the inverse of specific volume, so the equation now looks like this. 
Why can we ignore all of the other gas molecules? Because this van der Waals force has to be so short ranged that the tug from those molecules farther away is negligible. But why does the effect have to be short ranged? Because if it wasn't, the effect would add up and add up and add up and add up as you add more matter, increasing in strength. As a result, the phase change would then depend on the amount of matter present. For example, the boiling point of water would increase in temperature depending on if you are trying to boil a teaspoon, a gallon, or a swimming pool. This obviously doesn't happen, so the van der Waals force must only be effective at short ranges. So what do the curves of this equation look like? Let's start by plotting out curves of constant temperature on a graph of pressure versus volume. At high temperature, the curve is close to the ideal gas law and looks like an inverse function. But as you step down in temperature, you start to notice a kink developing in the curve. That kink flattens out, then it reverses in slope. Stop and think about what a reverse slope means on this curve. Normally, as you apply pressure to compress a gas, shrinking its volume, the outwards pressure that the gas exerts increases and pushes you back. But on this part of the curve, the outwards gas pressure that should resist your push decreases. The gas collapses in on itself until it reaches the other side of the curve. This part of the curve is thus unstable. Effectively, this is condensation. The gas molecules initially resist being pushed closer together, but once they're close enough, the attractive force between molecules takes over, and some of them start to stick to each other. Not all of them stick to each other. The ones that do free up enough volume that some molecules can happily remain as a gas, and you get two-phase coexistence. So the left end of the curve represents the liquid phase, the right end the gas phase. Now, the stable transition points aren't at the minimum or maximum of the curve you see, because those points are at different pressures, and at equilibrium, the gas and liquid must coexist at the same pressure. So the stable transition points are on this line, where these two bounded areas of the graph are equal. Plot out all of these transition points, and there we go! We've constructed the liquid gas transition curve, which includes the critical point at its apex. Let me emphasize how important this is. The van der Waals equation of state not only modeled gas condensation, it predicted and modeled critical point behavior. Also, if you experimentally measure the critical point parameters of a gas, you can calculate estimates for the size of the molecule and the strength of the attractive force between them. An attractive force that, oh by the way, was fundamentally unknown to science at that time. For example, here's a list of values for B for a number of gases calculated from critical point data and calculated values of molecular radius assuming a spherical shape. Compared to independent measures of atomic radius, they're not bad. To be fair, calculations of molecular size from the van der Waals equation of state can't be considered unique or independent estimates, because they first require an estimate of the value of Avogadro's constant. The first true estimates of both molecule size and Avogadro's constant, indirectly, were made by Josef Loschmidt in 1865. That said, the van der Waals equation of state was used to estimate the critical points of those so-called permanent gases mentioned earlier. This would spur efforts that would eventually result in the successful condensation of these gases and the first production of cryogenic liquids. So the van der Waals equation of state is pretty neat. We must use it all the time, right? Well, not exactly. We don't need to get into the many ways in which the van der Waals equation of state is oversimplified. And saying that we don't use the equation is an overstatement. If you don't need perfect accuracy, just something to extend the ideal gas law without adding much more computational load, then the van der Waals equation of state works just fine. There are more accurate equations out there, but all of them are either extensions of the original or purely empirical. In broad terms, the philosophical underpinnings of the van der Waals equation of state remain true, but it does not succeed in accurately predicting the parameters of real phase transitions. So why are we talking about it? I'll split my defense into two lines, the practical and the philosophical. No, the van der Waals equation of state doesn't accurately predict the parameters of real phase transitions, but to be fair, Every model faces challenges trying to analytically predict phase transition behavior because it verges on the chaotic. When I said in my previous video that dragons exist at the transition lines, I was only half joking. As an example, one of many issues with modeling phase transitions is that the closer to the transition line you are, 
the more important fluctuations become. Fluctuations, what do I mean by that? What might look to us gigantic humans as a homogeneous material with uniform properties is really, at the molecular scale, a roiling mass of chaotic motion and fluctuating densities and bottom networks that differ in small ways from one place to another. Far from the transition lines, these fluctuations are small and average out, allowing us to ignore them completely and model the material with nice, simple equations. But close to the transition, small fluctuations grow into large fluctuations. We can no longer ignore these fluctuations, nor the higher order terms in our equations that make the math more and more complex. The problem only gets worse the closer you get to the transition line, and that's before we even start talking about kinetics versus equilibrium. The devil and the dragons are in the details, and near a transition, the details matter a disproportionate amount. I'd say that there are two ways an equation can be useful. The first way is to make accurate predictions with a reasonable amount of computation. Personally, I think that way too many people mistakenly think that this is the only use for equations. I'll get to that in a bit. For this purpose, a useful equation balances accuracy and range of applicability with ease of use. After all, the ideal gas law is still used, because despite being limited in what it can model, it does so with decent accuracy using elementary school mathematics. The van der Waals equation estate allows for crude modeling of non-ideal gas behavior with minimal additional mathematical effort. In contrast, quantum field theory is one of our most accurate models for the physical world, but the math can be so complex that it can only be applied to relatively straightforward problems or with some compromises. Equations are not just machines for plugging in numbers to get out other numbers. I'm sorry, but if you are a student in science or engineering and think that getting the right numbers is the only thing you need to do, you need to do some serious soul searching. We already have machines that can plug numbers into equations and spit numbers out with mind-boggling speed and efficiency. You're probably watching this video on one of those machines right now. Any job or task that can be automated either already has been or eventually will be unless the industry spends a bundle on congressional lobbyists. The second and I believe more important way that equations can be useful is as a shorthand language for understanding physical phenomena. You can say that the equation is the shortest possible way to state the entire script of this video. And simplified equations, however inaccurate, are useful to help build intuition. Intuition is an expression of not only a solid base of knowledge, but of deep level understanding. It's built slowly, iteratively, one layer on top of another, and serves as a foundation upon which new ideas are built. There is good reason for teaching Coulomb's law before quantum mechanics. There is good reason to teach Newton's mechanics before Einstein's relativity. Yes, Newtonian mechanics is technically less complete than relativity, but it requires less background knowledge, it's accurate enough for most earthbound applications, and I honestly don't think we would be able to teach relativity as effectively, nor would it seem as profound, if the students didn't know Newton first. Let's take a look at the van der Waals equation of state and some of the more accurate equations that have been developed afterwards. The two van der Waals parameter we can easily understand as being related to molecule size and the strength of the interaction force, and you just need beginner calculus to work with most of it. These newer equations are more accurate, but these eight parameters, what physical aspects of the system are they related to? A lot of these parameters aren't rooted in any physical argument, they're just there to fit experimental data and the increased complexity makes it more difficult to visualize what's going on, especially for new students. I think it's useful to be aware of this balance between pedagogy, utility, and mathematical or conceptual rigor in science. Grant Sanderson recently gave a talk on a similar topic in teaching math that I recommend you watch. We teach the van der Waals equation of state first to students because it's easy to understand and practice with. Equations that model reality better have been developed in recent years, but they're more complicated. Depending on what you need to do, you may choose the simpler equations if you only need ballpark numbers or need to reduce computational load. Or you may forego equations entirely and work off of databases of the most accurate experimental data. Just remember, all models have limitations. All of them. Yes, even that one. Models are man-made tools that attempt to simulate reality. They do not create nor dictate reality. 
Like a good handyman, you have to understand the limitations of each tool available and choose the right one for the job. A hammer is useful for more than pounding nails, but I wouldn't use one to cut down a tree. At a time before molecular theory was universally accepted, the Van der Waals equation of state outlined a molecule-based framework for understanding not only gas condensation, but other critical phenomena. It made the first concrete step beyond the ideal gas law and inspired the development of cryogenic liquids, and it generated new questions about the interactions between molecules, particularly the force that would eventually bear Van der Waals' name. Honestly, not all that bad for an equation that just added two simple terms to the ideal gas law.